Peace is the creation of harmony. Harmony is the composition of people coming together. Creating peace and harmony requires the skill of a symphony orchestra conductor. Picture this. You are conducting a peace operation in a war zone in a foreign country. The first thing that you're going to have to do is understand the culture of that country. Then you're going to have to get all the warring sides and factions to put down their guns and agree to stop fighting. Then you're going to have to risk the lives of your troops by sending them in. And you know what? No one seems to have an answer to this problem. Only 11 of 162 countries are not in conflict. And if you look up there, there we are, New Zealand in green, one of the 11, one of the very lucky 11. But would it surprise you to know that here in New Zealand, we have the world's greatest peace maestro. His name is Roger Mortlock, and he ended a war using guitars instead of guns. And it was a revolutionary idea. And no one thought that he could go to Bougainville and end that civil war with guitars. And he orchestrated modern history's most successful peacekeeping mission. So today, I'm going to share his story. He's never bragged about it, because he's a very humble, humble guy. But today, I will be his brigadier. <laughs> so who is Brigadier Mortlock? Well, he's a peace maestro, career soldier, and many people consider him a philosopher. He commanded a failed UN peacekeeping mission in 1992 to Angola. He took that loss to heart. And he spent the next 10 years studying and looking at peace operations, and he took all his studies, and he developed a radical new plan to create peace in this world. Now, I happened on the story of the Bougainville peacekeeping mission because I was a young student journalist at the time, and the big headline read, New Zealand Army ending war using guitars instead of guns. And everybody thought he was crazy. The media thought he was crazy, international media thought he was crazy, Talkback Radio wanted to lynch him, but I, I was the only one that didn't think he was crazy. I thought he was insane. <laughs> but, to my amazement, he created lasting peace in Bougainville. And, to be honest, I didn't think, it, think about that whole story again until one Saturday morning. Um, I was sitting on my couch, as I normally do on a Saturday, but my little daughter was now six months old and beside me. I'd spent a few years in Israel and Palestine in my 20s, and I loved those people and I loved the land. And I was reading a story about the ongoing conflict that was going on, and then I saw an image, a little girl's hand reaching out from the rubble of a blown up building. And that hand reached off the page and touched my heart. I reached over and touched my daughter's hand. She was only six months at the time. This child could have been anyone's daughter. And we're living in a world where this is going on. And in that moment, I decided I wanted to do something. So I decided, I resolved that I would work to save one child from the horrors of war. Now, one child from the horrors of war seems like a crazy idea, but Mortlock was crazy too, so maybe we could combine forces. But the thing is, my family are all from, from, from a war history. My great-great-grandfather came, came over here in 1860 for the uh, land wars, the New Zealand land wars. His son went to the Boer War. My great-great-granddad to the First World War, my granddad to the Second World War, my father was drafted in 1960 to the army, and I lived in relative peace and harmony. One day, I did pluck up the courage to call Roger Mortlock. Now, I thought, what could go wrong? Because my intention is right here. You know, if you've got the right intention, you should make the call and see what happens. So I gave him a call, and I said, hello, Brigadier Mortlock, it's William Watson. I'm a journo from Auckland. 
um, and I want to do a story on the peacekeeping mission in Bougainville. He proceeded to tell me he didn't like Aucklanders or journos. <laughs> so that was 12 years ago. Uh, four countries, one bankruptcy, uh, one armed holdup, and lastly, all my hair ago. <laughs> so it's been a fun journey. We're good friends now, and I got to go to Bougainville with him. Now, when I talk about Bougainville, most people think sort of West Auckland, sort of Henderson Way. <laughs> but I'm going to tell you it's not. It is at the top of the Solomon Island chain. But interestingly enough, it is a province of Papua New Guinea. Now, I forgive you for not hearing of the war because there was a complete naval blockade and media ban. No news came out of that war. But geographically and ethnically, Bougainville is completely different to Papua New Guinea. But one thing Bougainville had that the new PNG needed was a vast amount of mineral wealth. And it had the largest copper mine, largest copper deposit ever found on this earth. And in 1972, BCL, a subsidiary of Rio Tinto, created the world's largest copper mine. Half of the wealth of PNG came from that one mine. After 20 years of operation, it became the largest hole on Earth. It could be seen from space. It rose the Jabba River up 70 foot. The water that got sent down was full of arsenic, mercury, and sulfate. It killed every single living thing. Angry locals, wanting to stop the destruction of the environment, blew up the pylons. The PNG, bearing the loss of the income, came firing in and killed 200 locals, including children. The war raged for 10 years, from 1988 to 1998. It was under the cover of darkness. No media and a naval blockade. No one could come in, no one could go. 20,000 people died, 15% of the population and all 14 peace attempts failed. In silence, the horrors of war unfolded in Bougainville. But realizing the magnitude of the problem, New Zealand sent in Brigadier Mortlock. He went into Bougainville and he asked the woman, what is this war all about? They said it's about the destruction of the land that land is the heartbeat of the people. And Bougainville is a matrilineal, matrilineal society. Land gets passed from mother to eldest daughter. And they are even living beyond my narrow view of land ownership. The women in Bougainville are keepers of the land. They are keeping it for the next generation to enjoy. Mortlock soon discovered that none of the first 14 peace attempts included any woman, and they are the backbone of conflict resolution. The warring factions in Bougainville were invited back to Burnham in New Zealand for peace talks. The key instrument would be a cult cultural approach, the Pacific way for Pacific people. In Burnham, they received a Māori welcome and were accommodated onto a marae. Now, it was really good timing because the New Zealand army had just fused with the Maori culture. A blending of cultures, the best of both cultures. The new fusion was called Ngāti Tomatuinga, with multicultural values and marais on all its bases. The first 14 failed peace attempts were all held in army barracks with foreign mediators. Bougainvilleans use face-to-face -face negotiations to resolve their differences. Now, Bougainvilleans had a chance to bear their soul and share the suffering that the war had caused. But the most powerful moment in Bougainville was the hongi. That is the touching of the noses and the sharing of the breath. As enemies touched noses, the Bougainvillians touched each other's hearts. 
the hearts of the hardest combatants melted and they burst into tears. Those tears washed away the initial pain and animosity. So agreement was reached between Bougainvillians for Bougainvillians, but stopping an entrenched war was always going to be difficult. So New Zealand crafted a peace agreement and a peace mission called Bella Lisi, which means take it easy. But, <laughs> good idea. <laughs> New Zealand was in the hot seat. It would lead and Mortlock would be the commander, but the orchestra wasn't big enough. Typically an orchestra has four sections. New Zealand could only muster one. So Mortlock quickly rounded up the other three sections with Australia, Fiji, New Vanuatu. Now the maestro was ready to play his symphony. The key instrument on the ground would be soft power. And the first instrument of peace was naturally an instrument. Guitars and music were played to a starved audience of entertainment. These people had not seen any music or any life. This was big. Evening concerts were performed, new songs were shared with locals. Guerrilla fighters put their guns down and came out of the jungles. Eddie Moen, a BRA fighter, said, playing music is the fastest way to connect to another person's soul. Soon, every kid was emulating its Kiwi rock star. Maori and Pacific culture were shared, and particularly the haka. Every haka was performed to a roar of excitement with the locals. And Mortlock said, in the end, we had to do the haka in every village to avoid massive disappointment. <laughs> and sport was another instrument, cricket, volleyball, and some brave peacekeepers that didn't mind having their ACL knocked out playing, <laughs> playing soccer. Aroha and love was another instrument for peace. And the soldiers shared their love with those war-ravaged people. Nurse Ruby Maranka said, the soldiers brought love with them in their hearts and that they empowered the woman's leadership. And a balanced number of male and female peacekeepers were sent to Bougainville. Women made powerful connections with the locals. Women were the percussion of the operation. They were the beating heart of peace. And as mothers, they had had enough of the killing of the children and of their environment. They empowered the peace process. Women made the men stop fighting. Women brought men out of the jungle to talk. Women became the brokers of peace. And women also instigate cultural reconciliation ceremonies. Transgressors apologize face to face and women break bows and arrows to signify peace is made. Bougainville's justice is restorative. Gifts are given for damage is done. Unlike our Western punitive system where the state punishes the wrongdoers. So amnesty was granted to all sides from Papua New Guinea and Bougainville for, for transgressions of the war. Therefore, none of them would be charged in going to jail if peace was to break out. Therefore, in harmony with the peace process, they joined in. Now, if we compare that to conflicts in Africa, upon peace being made, the warlords get charged and put in jail. So during Mortlock's command in Angola, the warlords sabotaged every attempt he made to create peace. The whole orchestra needs to play together or harmony will not prevail. Mortlock played his symphony. He created a lasting peace on Bougainville. And on April the 30th, 2018, is the 20th year of peace on Bougainville. Prosperity is returning, but also a plebiscite is coming, and they need to decide whether they want to have self-rule or stay in PNG. And our government and our region needs to support them in that decision. So unnoticed 20 years ago, a symphony of peace was played. We have created a musical score 
for ending international conflict. Weapons of war will not bring us peace, but weapons of peace like a guitar will. For my children and for your children, for my grandchildren and your grandchildren, let us inspire our military leaders of today, of today to adopt this brave but very simple idea. Thank you.